Being Reasonable comes to you from the WHUP studios in downtown Hillsboro, North Carolina. Please fasten your seatbelts. I'm Mark Solomon, and you are taking part in Being Reasonable, the weekly conversation show that focuses on how we've arrived on our steadfast views and our desire to know what is true. To participate in this friendly collaboration, all you need is respectfulness and an honest interest in the truth. We can all improve the way we form and consider our beliefs, and we can do so by being reasonable. One, two. On this week's show, we speak with Corey Whitaker, Area Director and Pastor for Triangle Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Corey discusses his belief that Christianity is true and is beneficial to the practice of medicine. So let's speak now with Corey Whitaker. So why is it important for practitioners of medicine to have a strong faith? Because as a Christian, you know, we believe that God is the author of life, that, um, that there are times that God miraculously intervenes in our lives, uh, including uh, healing or just bringing emotional comfort to someone who's struggling, bringing a peace in the midst of turmoil. Uh, there are a lot of different things that in our relationship with God that we believe that God does. And so I think that is a part of your practice of medicine including, you know, physicians make very difficult decisions, life and death, or, you know, it may not even be life and death. It may be whether this person has a disability the rest of their lives. You look at something like neurosurgery and all the things that can go wrong. At some point, I think as a physician, if you go in to do neurosurgery and you have confidence that God is giving you wisdom and skill, I think that's different than just going in and counting on your experience. So I think as a Christian, it gives you a confidence that God's hand is on what you're doing. So it's the belief that a faith in God is helping the physicians make proper decisions and which would lead to better outcomes and healthier patients. P- perhaps better outcomes. I mean, there may be a situation where a physician, you know, prays about to, to be wise about the, the next course of action and that does not go well. And the, the patient suffers or the patient dies. Our faith still comes into play in helping us make sense of suffering in the world, of knowing that we're not God, that, you know, I can't keep someone alive forever. Uh, that's not my role and, and that's not my ability. And so I think it also helps uh, physicians deal with failure, uh, what we would see as failure. You know, we're broken people with broken bodies. We have disease and injury. And without being able to refer to God in our understanding of the world, I think that becomes much more difficult. So does your belief that faith is helping physicians make good decisions, but also helps physicians if their decisions weren't on target. In this case, if faith wasn't playing a role, is there a way we could know that? Is there a way we could find out if it wasn't playing a role in physicians' ability to make decisions? And You mean, is there would there be a, a qualitative or quantitative difference in outcomes, for example? Well, that's one way. For example, would we expect... Christian physicians to have, let's say, better outcomes with their patients than, say, Jewish physicians? Or when things go wrong, would you expect Christian physicians to handle the situations better than, say, Jewish physicians? I'm trying to say if there's a difference we would be able to see in patient outcomes. Yeah, so there there have been some studies actually at Duke uh, on the effects of prayer on the outcomes of patients that actually showed a fairly positive outcome. Now, whether that comes from God's intervention and answering prayer, or whether that comes from the whole concept of the will to live and how our attitude and our desire affects our healing process. I don't really know. I haven't dug that deeply into them. Well, I think what you're saying is that the act of being a Christian or having faith in Christianity helps the outcome of patients, A, and B, helps alleviate suffering of the patient's and the physicians, if it doesn't go well. And I was thinking, well, if you could just compare those outcomes with physicians of a different faith, then we would know how well that works, right? 
Or am sure. I not seeing and, something? And, no, I, um, and I'm not sure there's been any studies to that effect. I think that would be yeah. something fairly difficult to set up, you know, say, all right, let's have some uh, Muslim doctors volunteer and some Christian doctors and some Jewish doctors. I do know that that for people who are believe in other religions, have other worldviews, you know, there are also some some things in those traditions that help them deal with suffering and pain and things like that. I mean, our ultimate goal at CMDA is really to, it's not just for the medical outcomes, it's really to support the individual. We really want to focus on their faith and building them up. I honestly believe that their faith in God, their relationship with Jesus is more important than whether they're an excellent physician. But I also do believe that so they're, so their say faith, that again, their faith in... I believe their relationship with God is more important than their practice of medicine. In terms of what? In, in terms of eternal significance. Uh, because as a Christian, I, I believe in heaven and hell, and I believe that uh, salvation is through Jesus Christ. And so if their relationship with God is struggling or distant or they never really fully come into faith in Christ, the, the consequences of that from a Christian perspective are much different than, than their medical practice. And CMDA exists because about 90 years ago, some physicians realized that, that they were facing some unique difficulties, such as the ongoing dealing with life and death. Yeah. Or, you know, even if you're a, a family practice, you know, you got people coming in, finding out all kinds of things that are wrong about them. Sure. And, and they're in tears and they're hurting. And then you take that home with you. But ultimately... I would rather have someone walk away from medicine than walk away from their faith. Let me put it that way. If someone had a strong faith in Christianity and it turned out that they weren't a very good physician, mm -hmm. does that say something about their physician skills or does that say something more about their faith? I think it would say more about their physician skills. I mean, I think there are, there are Christians in every profession that are not very good at their profession. You know, there are Christian lawyers who just are not good lawyers. There are Christian teachers who are not good teachers. There are pastors who are not good Christian pastors. And so... So faith is helping these physicians, and there are times when faith is not helping these physicians. So I'm trying to understand, how do we know it's the faith, right? How do we know that that's the thing that's helping them? Yeah, and, and that's a difficult question to answer, because I think that, you know, God is the one who gives us our intellect. God is the one who directs our godly desires when we choose to acknowledge what those are as opposed to our, our sinful desires. And so, for example, I'm thinking of a guy who's a neurosurgeon at Duke, um, and he's a fairly well-known neurosurgeon, very solid Christian. Uh, how much of his success is because of his faith in Christ and how much of it is because who God made him to be and the intellect and skill that he has? Well, I would say it's all God. I mean, God created him. God, you know, has has guided him through life on a particular surgery, whether he's successful or not, whether it's the recovery is good or not, how much of that's God's intervention or not. I, you know, I don't really have an answer to that other than if you see a miraculous healing. If you see someone who is has cancer and people pray for them and the next day they do another scan and it's gone, well, you know, we need to chalk that up to the supernatural. Um, well, let's say Tommy is a neurosurgeon and Tommy, let's say, doesn't have any belief. Let's say Tommy is an atheist and Tommy, by all accounts, seems to be a fairly good neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. How do we explain Tommy's performance as a neurosurgeon? Well, I would say that God created Tommy with incredible intellect and helped develop his skill over the years to be a blessing to people, regardless of whether Tommy acknowledges where that comes from or not. But if Tommy doesn't believe that, mm -hmm. and there is a Christian neurosurgeon who does believe that, how could we find out? How could we distinguish between the two? Because it seemed like that would be an important question, and we could find out what's causing these neurosurgeons to be so good. Uh, yeah, and I don't know... I mean, again, if we're looking at outcomes, I think if I could say that every time a Christian did a surgery, it always had a positive outcome, whereas for non-Christians, that wasn't always true, then we would have a measurable thing. Um, but I don't think their faith necessarily is the only thing that influences their, their ability. 
So how um, do we know that that's what it is? Because we don't know what's making them good. And if they're not good, we don't know why they're not good. But we could say it's faith. But if they're not a good physician, we can't say that it's faith is the reason. I'm, I'm just trying to understand how we know what we know. Right, right. right. Um, and again, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that other than, you know, faith isn't just a, an added advantage in your vocation. So, you know, a car mechanic, good car mechanic, bad car mechanic has to do with how well they learned and how intuitive they think. And so the faith um, doesn't play into some whether someone is a good car mechanic. Um, again, it, it may or may not. It really depends on what God is doing through what they're doing. Um, so um, if you were wrong about that, mm -hmm. how would you know? If I was wrong about well, that the impact of faith yeah, on a physician's on, on a ability, physician's ability and outcomes, and I don't know. I mean, I think that's that's part of the idea of faith is is looking at what is being done, and can I see God's hand in that? In other words, maybe a, a physician tries something that's unconventional, that it's something they've been trying to figure out. You know, a lot of me medicine is experimental; it's trying something new, and. Um, so maybe it's God that gave them the wisdom to be able to do that. Again, I don't think there's this this dichotomy of uh, God only helps Christian physicians do good things. Um, I think there are plenty of uh, atheists, uh, Jewish, Muslim, whatever. I, I remember years and years ago, someone I was listening to on TV said, "You know, I would if I needed surgery, I would rather have um, a Muslim doctor than a Christian butcher uh, do the surgery." And and so there's you know, there's something to where we are vocationally that the gifts God's given us. Um, I believe that all, the intellect that all of us have, I believe that's that's part of God's design for our lives individually. And I don't think God only works through Christians. So CMDA's function is not, we're not all about just making doctors more successful. Well, maybe, um, maybe I'll use a thought experiment, and you've probably heard this thought experiment before. Sure. Let's say that I believe that Buddy Holly is a god. He died, he rose, he was a musician, but now he's, he's a god. And let's say that I am a physician. And the reason why I think I'm a good physician is because Buddy Holly has given me the gifts to be a good physician. Well, I, you know, I can't tell you what to believe or not. I would, if, if we wanted to dig deep, if we were talking about our beliefs, I would say, well, what evidence do you have that Buddy Holly is a god? What does it mean to be a god? What are the characteristics of a God or the God, and does he share in those characteristics? And, and what is your evidence of that? Um, again, this goes to the kind of the, the evidence to belief to faith. Mm -hmm. And if you said, well, I just believe it. I listen to his music, and I know he's talking to me through his music. I honestly wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that, um, because then I could uh, listen to Elvis and say the same thing. Um, so what, if, so what if someone asked you the same question then about— they would say, why do you believe it? So why do I believe in Christianity? What is, because you asked me what my evidence was, sure. and if someone turned that around to you, let's say, and they said, what is your evidence? And what would then you say? Okay. Um, simply put, without a, a four-hour radio show, you know, I, I see evidence of God in creation. I see evidence of God in the design of things, uh, working with doctors and, and medical students. I mean, the intricacy of the human body. So what if I said uh, that with Buddy Holly... I see evidence that Buddy Holly is God because of creation, because the way he works with me as a physician or he works with other physicians. I see that. And when I see that, I know it's Buddy Holly. It's my faith. Mm -hmm. Again, I would ask what would be that connection. So for me, I see creation as do people around the world, and they attribute creation to different things. So then I go to the evidence in the Bible, mm -hmm. and I would look at Scripture and say, you know, after 51 years of life, and I've read uh, a lot of other um, religious texts, uh, I think the Bible is internally consistent. That leap from evidence to belief to faith um, flows very well for me through Scripture. I've seen the evidence of God's work in my life and other people's lives, uh, both physically as well as emotionally and spiritually and relationally. So I've seen a lot of evidence that is consistent with the Bible and is inconsistent with other religious faiths. 
And so without getting into a, you know, this is what Christians believe versus, you know, mm-hmm. this faith and that faith, the world I've lived in, and I've certainly been exposed to a lot of other religious beliefs, and my beliefs have been tested. You know, I was a youth pastor for 25 years, and 13-year-olds can come up with questions that you can't even imagine. Um, and so to try to put those into context and to try to make those known as reasonable proposals uh, of faith. If I say that I believe in Buddy Holly because Buddy Holly spoken to me and I have strong faith and that he is a true God and and I think that believing in Buddy Holly is as God is an internally consistent belief. And if there is a third person wanting to know what is true, what is real about the world, mm-hmm. how could we help that person know what is a true belief in this case? So I would sit down with them with scripture and I would look at the Bible and what the Bible says about who Jesus is and what it means to have a relationship with God, what the human condition is. At some point, again, that's a matter of faith. You know, after you present that stuff, then then they have to decide, is this something I believe? And I, I do believe that that's where God works in people's hearts. And God convicts us on a level that is beyond just reason. Uh, and again, that goes to faith. Are you saying, are you using faith in this case that you're having a belief without evidence? No, because the Bible would be part of that evidence. Uh, the historical narrative in Scripture, the things that the Bible tells us about humanity just ring very true. Um, I think this year has been a year where the book of Ecclesiastes has been particularly relevant, that it seems like a lot of things are just vain and worthless, you know, as we've had to give up so much of our lifestyle, you know, our entertainment and our travel and and all that, and we have to decide what's really important. Well, that rings true with Scripture for me. And so, so no, it's not belief without evidence at all. I mean, there's, there's 66 books of the Bible that I believe are all evidence, consistent evidence for the Christian faith. So you're telling me that if for some reason you read the Bible and you came up with inconsistencies or read passages that didn't make a whole lot of sense to you, Mm -hmm. that you then wouldn't believe in Christianity? At this point in my life, no, I wouldn't say that because um, the things that I understand in Scripture, the things that I know in Scripture are true, are enough that the things I don't understand, I realize is my weakness and my ignorance, not because God is wrong. So at some point, it's it's kind of like... Um, but if that wasn't the case, if you were incorrect about that, is there a way we could discover that? If I'm incorrect about Christianity in, as a whole? In the sense that the evidence that you're relying upon with the Bible, mm-hmm. if you were wrong about that? Is there a way you could find out that you were wrong about that? Well, I think so. I mean, I think that, um, but I think in my life, I'm beyond that point. So no, I don't think there's anything that could change my mind about Christianity now. Are you telling me there's nothing, there's no evidence that could come along that would shake your faith? Well, to say no evidence whatsoever, I don't know. I I mean, I'd have to kind of brainstorm as to what that would be if, uh, if all of a sudden we found something that was historically credible In the 15th century, it says we made up Jesus and we made up Christianity, and that could be validated. Well, I'd have to take a serious look at it. But again, the conviction um, as a Christian is deeper than just intellectual conviction. Um, You know, I I believe I'm born again in Jesus Christ. I believe that the Holy Spirit resides within me. And, And the conviction of that is stronger than just an intellectual assent to something and saying, okay, I believe that that's, it's kind of like in the news right now, there's all this stuff about aliens, right? Um, and, and as the government know, and the, the, uh, the head of the space command in Israel said he and Trump were about to release information, you know, I don't know if there's aliens or not, but I read an article the other day and it said, would the existence of aliens disprove Christianity? In other words, Christianity says that God created earth mm-hmm. uh, as a special creation with, with mankind in his image. And, and sent Jesus, you know, to die for our sins, which means Jesus can't go die for somebody else now because he died and rose again. Uh, so would the existence of aliens disprove Scripture? And it was just a really interesting intellectual um, debate within the article and, and, and trying to see, wrap my head around what they were kind of getting at. And the answer would be no. It would simply be that, uh, for me, that that's simply something the Scripture doesn't address. I see. You know, the Bible doesn't, 
talk about other creations. So if there is the case that there is another creation. Well, uh, back, back to what yeah. I was saying with my thought experiment mm -hmm. with uh, Buddy Holly as a real actual God. If I told you there is nothing, it's a, it, that, that belief is settled for me, that there is nothing you could say that would change my belief that Buddy Holly is a real actual God. What would you think about me saying that? Um, well, being that you, you had, now I hope this isn't really a belief because I'm about to attack it, but uh, that you haven't given me any evidence that Buddy Holly is God. It's just your opinion that Buddy Holly is God because you believe that he's God, but you haven't given me any evidence. He hasn't done anything miraculous. He hasn't done anything godlike. Um, he has not revealed himself. You know, one of the key components. What would he need to do to show you that he was a god? Well, he'd probably need to show up and do something godlike. Like, um, but but even then, uh, scripture talks about false gods and and uh, demons. You know, there's a whole spiritual world, and so it would take even probably a lot more than that. Um, but see, the the question wouldn't be whether I believe. It would be why do you believe that Buddy Holly's God? Has he done that for you? Has he shown up? Mm -hmm. uh, God did. I mean, Jesus came to earth and and lived and died, and there's a historical record of that. Uh, he's the most researched human being in the history of the world. If I said that Buddy Holly has showed up for me and that he has done wonders in my life and it's because of Buddy Holly that I met my wife and that I got the job that I got, and I believe Buddy Holly has done this, and there's nothing you can say that will change my mind. Mm -hmm. Then I wouldn't try to change your mind. Is it a useful belief for me to have? Short term, it might be. You know, um, it, you might be uh, really discouraged and frustrated in life. There might be, you know, everything's going sideways. And that belief in Buddy Holly may give you some temporary joy or some temporary hope. So it's okay for me to believe in Buddy Holly if it provides me with some sort of comfort, regardless if it's true. Yes and no. So for today, yeah, it would be okay for you to believe in Buddy Holly, but I would say eternally that would not be true. Um, you know, every major religion in the world has an understanding of what happens when we die. And every single religion in the world disagrees on that and asserts that what they believe is true. Mm -hmm. So they can't all be right. Right. Um, so as a Christian, I believe that if you're not following Jesus Christ, then you die, then your eternity is separated from God. Mm-hmm. So, um, so as a friend of mine, if you really believed in Buddy Holly and that was really your thing and we hung out together regularly, I would over time try to show you that there's something more reasonable to believe in through scripture. Um, because my concern would be not for your happiness or contentment or worldview here on earth. Yeah. Um, we may be on opposite ends politically. We may be on opposite yeah. ends socioeconomically, right. um, racially, whatever my concern would be for you eternally. And that's what I was saying about the physicians earlier. My concern is not whether they are the best physician. My concern is whether they are following Christ and glorifying God with what they're doing. So that would be my ultimate concern for you. So that's why it's a yes and no. So yes for today, that's okay. But that would not be my long-term hope for somebody. Well, the reason why I'm giving you my thought experiment in this case is that, is it valuable to have a belief, any belief, that can't be shown to be false. Because if a belief can't be shown to be false, then how do we know that it's true? So, so the question is, is there a value to believing in something that can't be falsified? Because what I'm telling mm -hmm. you is that nothing anybody can tell me will show me that Buddy Holly's not a god. And right. let's say for the purposes of this thought experiment, Buddy Holly is not a god. Right. He's a dead musician. Right. But I believe it, mm -hmm. and nobody could show me otherwise. There is nothing that can come along at this point in my life to show me otherwise. Is that valuable to have a belief that can't be shown to be incorrect, if it's incorrect? So, you know, again, I would say in the moment it might be helpful for you. In the long term, it would not be helpful for you, whether I can falsify it or not. Um, if you've got a disease and there's one cure— and you refuse to take that cure because you say that orange juice will do it, uh, you can drink orange juice till it kills you. And every day you may get up and have a positive outlook on life. I can't mm -hmm. disprove that orange juice isn't curing you in, until I know that you've survived. Well, the day you die, 
is the day we know that orange juice didn't work. Well, right? if someone has a virus and we want to know whether a vaccine cures that virus or whether orange juice cures that virus, mm -hmm. is there a way we could go about finding out that answer? Yes and no. We've got a short-term vaccine right now, you know, short-term studies that have shown a lot of success short-term. We don't know if that'll affect something in our bodies 20 years from now. Our evidence says that vaccines generally do not have long-term negative consequences. But I'm saying with orange juice versus vaccines, is that something that's unknowable or could we set up a test to find well, out what uh, is... Ultimately, we could. The, the problem with testing faith um, is we can always, if we're countering somebody's faith, so if I'm countering Buddy Holly's deity, I can argue against whatever you argue. You say, uh, Buddy Holly's appeared to me. I could say, you're delusional. You could say, Buddy Holly's music um, brings me peace and comfort. I can say, well, that's great. Elvis works for me. You know, So we can go round and round. The real... Um, well, how would that sit with you if someone said your belief is delusional? You are listening to Being Reasonable on WHUP. We continue our conversation with Corey Whitaker as he discusses his belief that Christianity is true and is helpful to the practice of medicine right after this short break. Thank you. 
This is Mark Solomon, host of Being Reasonable. Do you like the show and want to help? Please subscribe to Being Reasonable as a podcast and maybe even write us a review. Thanks. Well, how would that sit with you if someone said your belief is delusional? Well, they're entitled to their opinion. I would say that I have a lot of evidence that it's not, including things like the resurrection of Christ, uh, which, again, the most historically researched event in the history of the world. And even the most secular um, historians, scientists, will not deny that the tomb was empty and that they don't know where he went. All the other theories kind of fall apart, and we could do an apologetics session, I can defend all that. But the reality is, is that, again, I have enough evidence of, in my life, I have enough evidence in Scripture that it's not a huge leap of faith for me. It's not like saying that orange juice will kill or cure my cancer or cure, you know, whatever disease. There's a lot of steps in between there um, and a lot of evidence. So, so, and a lot of people do think anyone who's religious is delusional. You know, if you believe anything beyond just this, the dirt around us and the trees, that you're delusional. And, and I guess people can believe that. That's a hard way to live life, I think, because there's so much that goes on in life that really only makes sense in terms of the eternal. And so um, to believe that this is all there is, um, I, I think is a hard place to live because I think everything then is, is pretty much meaningless. Are you saying that if I believe in Buddy Holly as a god, then my life is meaningless? I'm saying I think you'll come to that conclusion. But is that the correct conclusion? No, because I think God can use you in spite of whether you have faith in him or not. You know, you got a neighbor that's uh, in a wheelchair who's, you know, infirmed, and you bring them lunch every day. So my life— And you can believe in Buddy Holly and still bring them lunch, and so you're still being a blessing to them. You're still doing—you know, you don't have to be a Christian to do nice things, to do—to bless other people. You know, okay, it's, so it's does, not, I, does, I don't think that, uh, it's called common grace. It means that, that God works in and through all of us. You know, in the Bible, for example, in this political season, it's a good thing to remember that the Bible talks about God appoints governments and rulers, and through those rulers, he'll bless us, and through those rulers, sometimes he'll discipline us. Um, it doesn't say that they need to be believers to be put into power. God can still use them either because of themselves or in spite of themselves, but he can still accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So that's, that's true for a physician. That's true for anyone who believes in Buddy Holly. Um, you know, is that your belief or is that something that you know as truth, like a universal truth, an objective that truth? That God establishes governments? Yeah, that God works in this way, whether we exist or not, whether we live or not, whether... You know what I'm saying? That yeah. this... I, I, well, you see it all throughout Scripture. I mean, you see it in the Old Testament and God raising up different kings, and it'll explain why he put this person in power. In fact, there's one point where Israel is saying, you know, w- when God was their, their king, that they just followed God, they had priests, and, and they said, we want kings like other nations have. We want to be like everybody else around us, the Hittites and all these other folks. And, and God said, that's fine. And he says, but, you know, they're going to send your children off to war. They're going to take your horses. They're going to, in other words, there's going to be consequences. I'm going to do it, but there's going to be consequences. So all the way, I mean, through Romans and through Revelation, it talks about God ordaining governments, God sustaining governments, God taking governments away. But if someone has like a different faith, and let's say they come to a different conclusion, mm-hmm. we are saying it's because that faith is incorrect and they're not following the one true Yes. God. Is that, I'm just trying, I'm not yeah. trying to put words in your mouth, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I mean, again, a, every religion claims that it's true, mm-hmm. that it's ad, other than uh, kind of the relativism that, that lives in our culture today. You know, if you ask a Muslim, they believe it's absolutely true. Right. You, you believe a Jew, they believe it's absolutely true. You believe a Scientologist, you believe, um, you know, you ask anybody so who has a, a, a Muslim will uh, come up with evidence in their scripture, mm-hmm. their book. Sure. Uh, for why their belief is true, and, and someone who's Jewish will come up with uh, evidence in their book why that's true, and someone who's a Scientologist will come up. And so it seems like there's a lot of faiths that have different books, and you will ask someone from different faith, and they will believe it to mm-hmm. their core that that is true. Uh-huh. How do we decide at that point? How do we figure out what's true, big T, like true in the world? Yeah. Well, I mean, first you have to establish that there is truth. 
And in our culture uh, in America today, some people would argue the only truth is your truth. Well, I'm assuming you know, that you're thinking that there is a truth big T. I, I do. I do. Right. But that's what I'm saying. So the beginning of that discussion with anybody would be establishing that there's truth outside of ourselves. And that's why I was asking yeah. that. Yeah. So it's not just, and that would be, you know, that would be the contention with the Buddy Holly belief. I would say, well, that's only a belief within you. But I say it's big T. I say it's a big T truth. Okay. So then you would need external evidence for that. If it's a big T truth, mm-hmm. um, you know, one thing that most religions have in common is they believe in revelation. They believe whatever God or gods that there are floating around in the universe, floating around on the earth, you know, whether you're, you know, Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, um, they believe that that truth has been revealed to us through a prophet, Mm -hmm. through, um, you know, if you're a Mormon, you got, um, you know, you got Joseph Smith. And so you've got- But but Buddy Holly revealed it directly to me. So I know it's true. Okay. And so you can be a prophet of Buddy Holly, then you would need evidence to move people to belief, to move them- to faith. I think the question was, you know, is, uh, can one of these be right and the rest be wrong? And, and the answer is yes. And so I do believe that Christianity is right and the rest of them are wrong. It doesn't mean that they don't contain fragments of truth, because I believe they were all designed by humans. But if someone who's Muslim says, well, Christianity has a fragment of truth. Right. And so I would sit down with a, with a Muslim friend and I would discuss that. And I would say, all right, here's, here are your scriptures here are my scriptures. Let's compare what they say. Let's see if there's, you know, again, then you get, you get but into why some... should we do that? Because you're not going to change your mind. And if your belief was false, it doesn't sound like there would be a way we could find that out. So what are we talking about? Why are we meeting and discussing? The point of the conversation would be if that Muslim is correct and I am incorrect, I still want to know what big T truth is. But how could what... you know then? Because you're telling me that you've reached a point in your life where that question for you is settled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I believe as Winston Churchill said, there's no point in having an open mind unless you eventually close it on something. And I've had to commit my life to a certain path in life and how I'm going to live and what I believe the consequences of that are both on this earth as well as eternally. Um, so, So I've committed to that. So yes, my goal in sitting down with a Muslim would be to convince them that Christianity is true. My, my goal in sitting down with someone Would you sit Jewish. down with them if on the onset of the conversation, the Muslim said that we can have a discussion, but I believe in my faith and there's nothing that you can tell me that will change my faith. It's true. So would I still have the conversation? Absolutely. But How come? Uh, for two reasons. One is I don't think they've thought of everything, just like I haven't thought of everything. And so there might be something that I say that they haven't thought of that convinces them that Christianity is Is there true. something that they could say that would change your mind? Well, again, yes, maybe, but, uh, but I don't know what that would be. So uh, 27 years in ministry, I've done a lot of reading, and I've read a lot of different opinions and a lot of different theological positions, even within Christianity. You know, even within Christianity, there's different theological, you know, what, baptism, you know, do we baptize infants or do you wait till someone professes their faith? You know, so there's all kinds of things that we need to mentally work with and be internally consistent and intellectually honest with. And so when I tell you there's nothing that would change my mind, it's because being intellectually honest, I don't even know what could be said, what could be presented to me that would change my mind. And maybe for that Muslim, that's true as well, that they are so convinced. But I don't know that. So I'm going to make the effort because I want that person in heaven. Right? Well, let's say and, that and so they I'm, I'm have... Gonna, I'm going to invest that time. So I've sat across from Mormons, for example. And so I've, I've sat across the table from, uh, from Mormon missionaries, and we've had this conversation. Uh, and to literally saying, what would I have to do uh, to get you to consider that what I believe really represents big T truth? And when a Mormon has asked you that, what was your response? You know, I'm not, I don't recall what my answer was. To be totally honest— at one point, you know, he, one of the guys said to me, he said, well, what can I do to change your mind? Because I said, what's the evidence? He said, well, you'll feel a burning inside. And I said, well, um, I need more than that. And mm-hmm. he said, what could I do to, to change your mind? I said, I honestly don't know if there's anything you could do. I said, you know, at that point, I was 45 years old, mm-hmm. um, had been in ministry my entire adult life. And so his response to me was, well, then you're wasting my time. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way you know, you're not wasting my time. I enjoy the conversation and I'm hoping that something I've said will resonate with you uh, a little differently. And so 
But it does um, sound like you're possibly wasting each other's time in that sense that you're not going to change your belief and he's not going to change his belief because there's no way to falsify each other's beliefs or your own beliefs and... Well, sure, there are ways to falsify some evidence. So let's put it that way. Okay. To, to falsify my faith as a whole okay. would be rather difficult. All you right. could chip away at evidence. So I would point to things like internal inconsistencies within somebody's religious texts. If their texts internally cannot rationally be reconciled so someone... with each other, or if, if the person through whom the text came... So if someone um, showed you internal inconsistencies in your text, you would no longer be if a If they Christian. were substantial, and and yes, I could not make sense of them. Like I said, you know, um, I'm sure someone could dig something out of Scripture somewhere that I can't make sense of, and I would have to chalk it up to, well, because I can make sense of the other 99.9%, .9%, that 1%, I'm going to have to hold on faith that I just don't understand it, not that it doesn't make— because I think God gives us reason. I know God gives us reason and rationality. Um, so one percent internal consistencies wouldn't do it for you. It would depend on what would, it is. But so would twenty percent? Would fifty percent? It would depend on what to, it is. So some yeah. of the inconsistencies people point to in scripture are things like uh, in in one book of the Old Testament, you know, in First Kings, it might record sixty thousand horses went into battle, yeah. or sixty thousand men, or something. And then when that story is retold later in another book of scripture, it might say sixty six thousand. So it's an internal consistency that, like consistency like that would not. That's a scribal error at some point. Somebody put an extra dot, you know, ink dripped on the paper. Uh, that is not a faith-based foundational discrepancy. Gotcha. If in the Gospels it says that Jesus is God, if he says, I and the Father are one, and then later in one of the, the books of the New Testament it says Jesus is not God, well, then that would be a significant problem. So if they— Because that's a faith-based— So if someone, let's say, found another Dead Sea scroll that was written around the time of Jesus, and it said that somebody took Jesus's body out of the tomb, sure. then you would no longer believe in Christianity. No, I don't think I'd go that far. I think I would want to really know if that was authentic. I mean, there's a lot of steps between just somebody providing stuff. There are things like the Gospel of Thomas. There's stuff that uh, Dan Brown used in the Da Vinci Code. So that wouldn't that so are, that wouldn't falsify your belief then. Well, no, because okay. you would have to. You'd so have you're to telling show... me that the belief can't be falsified. So go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let's say we found something in the Dead Sea Scrolls that was part of the New Testament, and it was on a parchment. And before and after a section, there was something in the middle that really discredited Christ. In other words, if we looked at it as we look at all historical documents and judged it by those standards, if it created a huge inconsistency, then yeah, I would have to really reconsider what I'm believing. Would that negate everything I believe? Not necessarily. I would be highly suspect of, of something being fraudulent. Uh, at that point, because there's been plenty of that. You know, there's plenty of fake fragments or fragments from... So it seems like if something like that were to happen, it would not necessarily shake your faith too much in the sense that you would chalk it up to counterfeit could be something else. Right. And and I think it would that would be a crisis for all of Christianity. I think it is it is incredibly telling that nothing like that's ever popped up. So... Again, it goes back to that question of, is it falsifiable? Well, if God's the creator of the universe, then you can't falsify him. So part of my belief that it's not falsifiable is because I believe it's true. And so you, you kind of end up in a circular argument there. Yeah. Um, that, uh, can you disprove Christianity to me? No, I don't think so. Well, it's because I believe it's so true. And so at some point, I, I, I put myself in a little bit of a little bit of a box, but that is the nature of faith. So really... All this evidence, all this stuff in Scripture, it comes down to that one event, the death and resurrection of Christ. And if that really happened, if Jesus is who he says he was, and if he really did die uh, for our sins and raise again, and therefore we can have a relationship with him and our sins can be forgiven, if that's true, we can argue about all that. We can argue about creation and evolution all day long. I think that's an important issue. But at the end of the day, it really has to do with you know, was Jesus who he said he was? Did he do what he said he was going to do? And does that have an effect on my life? And if it does, then that means everything. You know, if the Bible's right about that, that means everything. If, if it's not true, 
then I'm then I'm wasting my life. You know, going back to what we were saying earlier, then I, I'm really not. Yes, again, temporarily, I may be helping somebody out, helping someone with their radio show. I may be feeding my neighbor. I may be giving a homeless guy um, some food on the corner or something. But that's of zero eternal consequence. But but you're saying that if you are very helpful to other people, which mm-hmm. you seem that you are, you're very helpful to people who are in need. And there is a Muslim who is just as helpful who with people who are in need that for you, you will have an internal salvation. But for the Muslim, no matter how good of a person they are, that doesn't matter, right? Eternally. Mm-hmm. It doesn't saying. matter. Yes, I, I believe that. And they would say the same thing about me, by the way. They would say that because I'm not a Muslim, I won't have eternity with Allah. And so therefore, my good deeds on this earth are wasted. Um, I would not argue that their good deeds are wasted. I would simply say they have no eternal consequence. It's more the act of the belief itself in the deity that is key. So the most important thing for me in the lives of anybody else that I know and people I don't know is whether they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But someone who's an atheist, let's say, is being very helpful to people and they are devoting hours of their time. I'm just, you know, sure. just coming up with something. Sure. And it doesn't matter how good of a person, quote unquote, they are, because it seems like in the end, they are destined for an eternity that's not so great. Yes. It'd be a better scenario to have someone who doesn't really care about other people, but God has told you to help other people versus, I feel it's the right thing to do. I don't really believe in a God, but I really want to help my fellow human. So the former, it seems to be really what's on the line, right? I think there are all kinds of ways that God gets us to do what he wants us to do. And sometimes those things are selfish motivations to serve his end goals. So let's say you've got a, um, a, a buddy Hollyist <laughs> doctor, yeah. and I can get them to go on a mission trip with me, a medical mission trip to Jamaica uh-huh. to serve people. I yeah. fully believe that God can use that person. I also believe that God will reveal something about himself to that doctor, that they will see something in the Christian community and us serving that looks different than when they went with the Peace Corps, which the Peace Corps is a great thing right? But they're going to see something different in our community than they saw in that. And that's going to be a little bit of that evidence that maybe Christianity is true. I think it's always good to do good. But as again, going back to eternal consequences and, and eternal significance, if we're doing good out of selfish motivations, ultimately, it's not really good. From the WHUP studios in downtown Hillsboro, North Carolina, I'm Mark Solomon, and you've just listened to another episode of Being Reasonable. Questions? Thoughts? Connect with us at beingreasonableshow.com. See you next week.
Something's better than nothing 